I'm going to talk today about uh, testing for COVID or more generally about why testing is important for any disease. Um, and then I guess I'll talk for about 15 to 20 minutes and then I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you have uh, about COVID. Uh, I'm just to kind of give you background. I am a professor of health policy at uh, the Saul Price School at USC. Um, and I'm also the vice dean for research and faculty affairs for the school. Uh, my research, uh, I'm also a senior fellow at the Schaefer Center at USC. Uh, my research has kind of focused on a variety of things, uh, including infectious diseases, prescription drug policy, um, et cetera. So, but the last few weeks I have uh, been devoting all my time to uh, to this research on US on on COVID. So let me kind of uh, you know start by just kind of giving you a primer on why do we test for a for a for a disease and uh, and then kind of go from there. So the first, if you're a clinician, the first purpose, the primary purpose of testing for a disease is is diagnosis, right? So. I want to test if you have, uh, you know, virus X in your body. And if you have virus X, then I know drug A will work in helping you. If you have some other virus, then maybe another drug will work in helping you. So the first purpose of testing is to guide clinical decisions, to figure out what disease you have. And once you've figured out what disease you have, to guide decision making about what treatment you should get. Treatment for lung disease is very different than treatment for heart disease. Treatment for a virus is very different than treatment for a bacteria. So the goal of testing is to figure out what you have and then guide appropriate treatment. So now, uh, so that's the first purpose of, text, of, of testing. The second purpose of testing, which is only relevant for infectious diseases, is to figure out who has a particular disease and to figure out if, those, if that person is infectious and if they are infectious to isolate them uh, so that they cannot infect others in the population and uh, what public health folks call do contact tracing, which is if you are infectious and you have a certain virus in your body, then they ask you, hey, tell me over the last 10 days, who did you hang out with? Who, do, who were you in close contact with? And then go and test those close contacts and then test the contacts of those close contacts and so on. So this is basically called contact tracing. And you can see why this would be relevant for a disease like COVID or for any infectious disease uh, per se. So this is what, uh, what kind of South Korea did for COVID, that they, they tested early people who had COVID, they found out who they were in contact with, they tested those people, and any confirmed infections were quarantined. So basically, the second purpose of testing is trying to control the spread of a disease, any infectious disease. The, the third purpose of testing is uh, just trying to understand the disease. So this is relevant more for new diseases rather than old diseases, because for old diseases, we have thousands of research studies that have looked at it. So for a new disease, you wanna to test to basically understand basic facts about the disease. For example, how contagious is this disease? Uh, once someone gets this disease, how likely are they to be hospitalized for it? How likely are they to die from the disease? So you wanna test people so that you can kind of figure out how many people in the population have the disease, follow those individuals over time, maybe to figure out how many of them will get hospitalized, how many of them will die. And knowing these basic facts about the disease, how infectious is it, how deadly it is, is critical information for guiding public policy or for guiding public health uh, interventions. So I think there is some echo, so if you can mute yourself, uh, that would help with the feedback. Okay, so the, the third uh, purpose was to basically understand these diseases. 
and understand how deadly they are, how contagious they are, and so on. And now the last purpose of testing is to figure out who is immune. So you, you could test and figure out someone who actually had the disease and now has potentially recovered from the disease. So, so these individuals are, in some sense, the lowest risk individuals, and we might want to identify uh, if there are such individuals in the population or not. So now let's think about COVID and, and the utility of testing uh, for COVID. So the first utility would be, okay, we want to figure out uh, how to treat an individual with COVID. So we are doing COVID testing uh, to guide clinical decision-making. And there the utility is, is little or none because we don't have a treatment for COVID. So if you tell your doctor you have COVID, it really doesn't change the way the doctor treats you. So what we are treating for COVID is not the disease, but the symptoms of COVID. So if you are breathless, there is a treatment for, for easing your breathlessness. If your lungs collapse, you have to be on a ventilator, but it's got nothing to do with your diagnosis of COVID. Anyone for any whatever reason, if their lungs are not functioning and they cannot breathe, they have to be on a ventilator. So the purpose of testing to guide diagnosis or guide clinical decision-making, that's very limited for COVID. So now let's take the second purpose, which was we want to avert the spread of infection by doing what I call contact tracing, right? So if, I, if, they, if someone finds out I have an infection, I might have come in touch with 100 people in the last 10 days. And so now they need to go test those 100 people, and those 100 people might have been in touch with another 100 people. So you can see that even with just one infection, contact tracing involves testing thousands of people. So now if you say there are millions of people already in the U.S. who have COVID, then contact tracing becomes practically infeasible because these million people might have come in contact with millions of other individuals and we just don't have the capacity to go out door to door and test these millions and millions of people in the population who either have COVID or had come in contact with COVID. So contact tracing is really useful early in the epidemic. When we just have a few hundred or you know, a few thousand cases. But when the epidemic has reached a stage where we think there are already millions of people with the disease, contact tracing just becomes infeasible. It, it just becomes too, too difficult to manage uh, on, on, on such a large scale. So my view is that we've missed the boat for contact tracing. We should have done contact tracing maybe sometime in January when we, you know, it was just the first couple of weeks uh, when we knew that there was a COVID epidemic going on in, in China, that was a time to test every person who we suspected to have COVID, find out if they had COVID, go back to their contacts, test them, and so on. But now we have what is called community spread or community infection, where we potentially have millions of people in the U.S. who already have COVID or have had COVID, and... Uh, it's, it's just impossible to do uh, uh, contact tracing on this large scale. So now the third question becomes, do we want to learn about COVID? Definitely, yes. It's a new disease. It's probably one of the least understood diseases right now, and it has huge consequences. So what happens when we don't understand the disease? We prepare for the worst case. So we've come up with this worst case scenario that COVID is going to be, you know, 10 times more deadly than the flu. And therefore, we are preparing for that worst case scenario. The other thing what we've done is the way we've tried to learn about this disease is completely wrong. So what we've done is we've tested only people who have severe symptoms, people who have ended up in the hospital, and once you test those people and then you, you try to figure out how many of those people died. So what happens is if you test the sickest part of the population and then try to learn from that, 
you're not going to learn a lot. And what you're going to come up with is a highly biased estimate. So this is kind of similar to if I want to figure out what is the life expectancy of people in the U.S. and I only use a sample of cancer patients to figure that out, you know I'm not going to get the right answer, right? So, or if I want to say predict whether President Trump will get reelected and I only poll Republicans to figure that answer out, I'm not going to get the right answer. And it doesn't matter if I poll five Republicans to find the answer or 50,000 Republicans to find the answer. I will still get the wrong answer because it's a biased sample, right? I will, in fact, with a 50,000 sample, I will get a precisely wrong answer, but it will be the wrong answer. So the basic statistic says, if you, find, if you want to find out the right answer, you need to be polling a representative set of the population. So you don't only poll Republicans, you poll a representative set of people who might vote in the elections and use that poll to figure out who's going to win the election. Similarly, if you want to figure out how deadly a disease is, how contagious a disease is, you don't just test the sickest population. You test a representative set of the population and then figure out how many people in this population have the disease, then figure out how many of these people might potentially die from the disease or might be hospitalized. So I basically wrote an editorial in the Wall Street Journal uh, about three weeks ago uh, on March 15th. And then I wrote another editorial uh, another uh, a week later, basically arguing that we, the way we've been testing is wrong. What we need to be doing is testing a representative set of the population to figure out how contagious this, this disease is, how deadly this disease is, and then based on that information, make policy decisions. So in those uh, two to three weeks, uh, a lot has happened. And now I'm poised to, uh, to do uh, this testing in collaboration with Los Angeles County Public Health Department uh, in about 10 days. Uh, so we're going to run our first pilot test in about 10 days. And if that is successful, we will be repeating this uh, every two weeks. So, uh, but this is part of a research study. So if you email me and say, hey, Neeraj, I want to get tested, the answer is no. Uh, you have to be part of this research study and recruited in this research study uh, to be tested. So, so that's kind of number three. So that's what we're trying to do is learn about this disease and then basically use that to help guide uh, public policy decisions. So the last purpose of testing was to figure out if people are immune from the disease. So to explain that, there are two types of tests. So there is one test for COVID that's called a PCR test. And what a PCR test does is it, you take a swab from your throat or from your nose and they, they test that swab for, for RNA from the virus, from the coronavirus or the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So they're actually trying to test whether you have the virus in your body. That's the PCR test. And what that tells you is you have an active infection. The virus is right now in your body and you're suffering from COVID. There's another test called a serologic test or an antibody test. So what happens is when you have a virus or a bacteria in your body, your body tries to fight it by producing these immune cells called antibodies. And these antibodies for a lot of people are actually successful in fighting the virus and eliminating the virus from your body. But these antibodies still stay on guard. So even when the virus is gone, you still have these antibodies in your blood, which are, are, are ready to fight a reinfection or a future infection. So there is another test that basically tests for these antibodies. And, and so now imagine you combine these two tests together. So one test says you're antibody positive, which means your immune system is primed to fight this disease. And another test says 
you are virus negative. That means your body won. There's no longer any virus in your body. So these people have two properties. First, they are the lowest risk for getting COVID because they already have antibodies to fight COVID. So even if they get reinfected, their antibodies are going to kick in and fight COVID. The second is, since they don't have the virus in their body, they're virus negative, they cannot infect others. So now if you're virus negative and antibody positive, what I call them is you are a COVID warrior. You cannot infect others and others cannot infect you. So you can now go on the front line, take care of the elderly, take care of patients who have COVID, etc. Re-enter the workforce, be at a restaurant, serve meals, because once you are virus negative and antibody positive, your risk of getting COVID or your risk of giving COVID to someone else is very low. So that's phase two of the project, that once we've kind of done phase one, what I would love to do is set up testing centers all across LA, all across the US, where we can do this on a large scale. Uh, so that's kind of what the, what the vision is for the last uh, part of the project. So basically, uh, you know, what I'm trying to do right now is uh, there are a lot of challenges in doing the research as well as phase two of the project. Uh, I'm actively fundraising for it, solving logistic challenges, solving research challenges, solving scientific challenges. These tests are very new uh, and solving uh, ethical challenges on how do we communicate about these tests, their results, and so on. Um, so I'll probably stop there and take yep. any questions you have. All right, so the first question that we have um, is from Dowell Myers. Is contact tracing the same as a snowball sample, which is then not representative of the population as a whole? Yes, that snowball sample and contract tracing are very similar. And yes, he's right that it's not representative of the population as a whole. Okay, next question is from Michael Lowe. Will testing for antibodies as opposed for signs of the virus be more useful for contact tracing? So for, for contact tracing, you, you need both. You need to know, so if the purpose, suppose you just test for antibodies, you might identify people who already had the infection and recovered from it. So they are at a low risk of transmitting the infection to others, and you don't want to quarantine them. So for contact tracing, you want to get people who are actively, who have the virus in their body, and then they can infect others. And those are the people you want to isolate and quarantine. So PCR testing is, is more important than antibody testing for uh, contact tracing. But for a scientific study to understand how contagious this virus is, you want to do the antibody testing. Because what the antibody testing is telling you is whether you ever had COVID. So it's, it's a historical view of whether you had COVID or not. The PCR test is telling you, do you have COVID right now? It's a snapshot. So for a scientific study, I want the whole history and not a snapshot. But for preventing secondary infections, I want to know right now, are you infected or not? Okay. Um, next question is from Matthew Watterson. How far has the fight against COVID-19 been set back by the disjointed efforts around the globe, especially regarding testing as a means to minimize the impact of the disease going forward? So as I said that, you know, if we had started contact tracing early on the disease, there was a chance that we could have averted a, a pandemic or an epidemic. Uh, but hindsight is 2020. You know, uh, contact tracing takes a lot of resources and we probably didn't have the infrastructure and, and you know, we didn't want to believe that this, is, this was going to be something that could uh, stall the world economy and lead to thousands of deaths. So, yeah, in hindsight, we should have done contact tracing in, in January or, you know, China should have done contact tracing in late November or early December. And we could have averted uh, all of this pain that we are all suffering right now. Uh, but it's, it's easier to say that in hindsight than when you are actually at that point in time. Right. Um, the next question is from Veronica Perry. Can you touch on the false positive, false negative issues of the test? Sure. 
So uh, there are, uh, so if you look at the PCR test, uh, there is variation in, uh, in the false positive or the false uh, negative rates of the PCR test. So the initial PCR tests were done in a more uh, controlled environment where they would take the swab from your throat or your nose, take it, take that kit to a lab, do the testing in a very controlled environment in a lab. And the general case was, uh, the impression was that these PCR tests were highly sensitive and specific, which means they had a low false positive and low false uh, negative rate. There have been some recent reports where they've tried to do what are called point of care PCR tests, where you don't send the test to the lab and you do the PR te PCR testing in the doctor's office or right in front of the patient. And <clears throat> those PCR tests, there are some reports that they, they are not as accurate as we would like them to be. Uh, the antibody tests are, are, they were like approved by the FDA under their emergency use authorization uh, less than 10 days ago. So they are, are, are fairly new. And um, they have, at least based on what the manufacturers have submitted to them to the FDA, these tests have a very low false positive and a very low false negative rate. Uh, so their false, po their uh, sensitivity and specificity is in the 95 to 99% range. But these tests are still new, so we don't know what the true sensitivity and specificity would be when we start using these kits in the field. So one of the things, uh, one of the scientific challenges is trying to validate these tests. So as I said, as, at the same time when I'm planning to do the study, I have another group of scientists working on trying to validate these tests. Um, the next question is from Rachel Lickman. Do you know of any efforts of the national level to do something similar to your testing pilot? I, uh, I, I haven't seen uh, any national effort to do that. Uh, we are uh, trying to also at the same time launch a national study. Uh, so if you're successful, you will read about it in the newspapers in a few days. Okay. Um, next question is from Sharon Bliss. Can the public donate to funding for this project? Yes, they can. And I would love that because I'm trying to uh, raise money for all the research. And uh, you can either email me and I will put you in touch with our development office who have uh, uh, set up a fund uh, uh, to contribute uh, to this effort. So I would greatly appreciate it. I have raised about uh, $100,000 for the study, but I, I, I need a, a lot more resources uh, to get this done, especially phase two of the study. Okay, next question is from Lynn. What is the estimated actual infection counts in LA and the US? And the second part of that question is the predicted death counts of 100 to 200,000 seem pretty high comparing to the, current, to the current count. What would bring about this worst case scenario? Uh, so that's a great question. So the first answer to that question is, we don't know. And if we can do the type of study I'm talking about, we would know. So let me kind of give you an example. Uh, so right now, the only cases of COVID we know are people who had severe symptoms, who could get a doctor to order a test for them, and that test result was reported to a public health department. And then the public health department reported that test result to the CDC and nothing went wrong in the reporting. There was no error, et cetera. So you can see there are a lot of people who might have COVID whose test results are never reported to the CDC. So these could be people who are asymptomatic a lot of people believe that there's a big population of people who have COVID who, sh who exhibit no symptoms. There is another population who exhibit fairly mild symptoms. So you have an itch in your throat, you feel a little strange, but then you get over it in a, in a couple of days. So you really don't know whether there was COVID or whether you've been on too many Zoom calls and your throat is just, you know, 
you soar. Like I, I have had that feeling in the past <laughs> couple of weeks, uh, several times where I'm like, am I doing too many Zoom calls or is there something wrong with my throat? So, so there is a big population of people who might actually have COVID have what I call non-specific symptoms. There could be a third population who have symptoms, who had a fever, and you go uh, to your doctor and your doctor says, hey, let's do a Zoom call. And then they, the doctor says, hey, why don't you take Advil's and see if you feel better in a few days? And if you don't, then let's figure out if to get you tested. So that's another set of people who exhibited symptoms but never got tested. Then there's going to be people who would be like, okay, I really want to get tested. I have severe symptoms. They're not going away. And then the doctor tests them, but the doctor never bothers to report the results to CDC or the public health department because they forgot, they're too busy, there are other things happening in their clinic. They didn't have the time. So we're missing those people also. So who are the people we're getting? Potentially the people who are fairly sick, who the doctor does the test, the test is reported to the CDC and so on. Uh, so I think that's a very small population. And, and just to kind of give you an example, for the flu, the normal flu, uh, the CDC estimates that for every confirmed case of flu reported to the CDC, there are 80 unconfirmed cases. So for every person who's reported to the CDC, there are 80 other people who actually had the flu, but were never reported to the CDC. So now the question is, do you think for every confirmed case of COVID, how many people are there who had COVID who were never tested, given the amount of testing we have done for COVID versus the amount of testing we do for flu? So for flu, we do about a million tests a year. For COVID, we are trying to achieve that, but we, I don't think we have achieved that, right? So the answer is there could be a lot of people who are infected who we really don't know about. And then you need to compare the deaths we have today to that underlying population of people with infection. And that gives you what the mortality rate from COVID is. What we've done right now is compare the deaths we have today to the small, the tip of the iceberg of the cases that were reported to CDC. And, and that number is, is much larger than for the flu. And that's our worst case scenario. And that's why we are, you know, we, we are kind of nervous about this disease. So what I'm trying to do is truly figure out how many people have the disease and then use that number to figure out how deadly this disease is. Great. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, maybe two, um, but I just want to let everybody know that we are going to post this video up to the Price Talks webpage. Neeraj's contact information will be on there, and we will also have a link for his giving page that he mentioned earlier. So the next question is, what are we using as the gold standard for detecting this virus? And that's from Wayne. So right now, the, the gold standard is the PCR test. And it's not the point of care PCR test, but the type of PCR test you send back to the lab. Um, so that's what the gold standard is, but that might change. Uh, there are a lot of new diagnostic tests being developed. Uh, so I, I, you know, this field is going to evolve uh, in the next few weeks, I think, not even months. Okay. Um, the next one is from Virat. Immunity fades over time. How fast are COVID antibodies fading? Is a person once cured from COVID 100% safe from not getting the infection again? So they are not 100% safe. Uh, we don't know how long the immunity is going to last because, again, it's a new disease. But the first step in figuring out how long immunity is going to last is to identify people who are recovered and then follow them over time to see how many of them actually get reinfected with the disease or not. If you talk to a lot of virologists and immunologists, which is what I've been doing, their view is that the immunity is going to last at least for a few months. So their view is that having these antibodies in your system is, is definitely going to help you. Uh, but do we know for sure? Uh, no. Uh, there's another study where what they did was they took patients who had recovered from the disease and had these antibodies they extracted these antibodies from these uh, recovered patients 
and they injected those antibodies to patients who had severe COVID, who were on ventilators. And the symptoms of these patients who, were, who had severe COVID improved dramatically when they were injected with these COVID antibodies. So which again shows that these COVID antibodies might be very powerful in fighting the disease. But this study was done with a sample size of five five COVID patients in an ICU. So we still need to learn a lot about this disease, but it seems very promising that if you have these antibodies, you at least have a pretty strong immunity, even if not 100%. Okay, and we'll, ask, we'll end with one last question that just came through from Roy Dunway. How accurate are the total deaths from China? You gotta ask China, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. There have been news stories about, you know, initial news stories where China was really collaborating with the World Health Organization and, and uh, you know, these numbers were accurate. Uh, but then uh, the more recent reports say they might not be accurate. So I, I really don't have uh, insight into that question. Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us today for today's Price Talks. I hope that you enjoyed the session. Our next one is on Wednesday, April 8th, and we will be discussing the impact of the pandemic on the economy. Um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to shoot me an email directly. And like I said, I will have everything posted to our Price Talks webpage. Thank you so much, Neeraj. Thank you. Bye-bye.